Howdy, howdy. Welcome to episode number 91 of Fight for a Happy Life, the show that believes even a little martial arts makes life a whole lot better. Ando here, and today I would love to talk to you about self-improvement. Now that term, self-improvement, sounds, of course, very positive. And wouldn't you say that every human being, on some level, is interested in self-improvement? I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning intending to make their life worse. I don't think anyone is purposely trying to destroy themselves, even the people who are ending up unhealthy and bankrupt. I don't think that was their intention. Somewhere their self-improvement efforts went awry. And that's what I want to talk about, the dark side of self-improvement. Now, speaking for myself, um, I can tell you that I've always been interested in self-improvement. Even as a little kid, uh, I had a hard time going to sleep. I was a night owl. And the reason was, when I thought about it years later, is I had that fear of missing out. If the adults were up talking late, I wanted to hear what they were talking about. I wanted to see who was on the Johnny Carson show. I always felt like something was going on and I was gonna miss it if I was asleep. And so as a result, well, I was fatigued a lot in my youth. I had a lot of pimples through high school. I just didn't want to go to bed. So on a very low level of damage, uh, my thinking about self-improvement was leading me into a bad habit. I didn't respect sleep. Now, I applied that same compulsion, and I do think it's a compulsion, when I tell you right now that I've never needed motivation to work out, which is contrary to a lot of the emails that I get. People say, how do you keep doing this? How do you have so much discipline? I can't work out. I just feel like I'm lazy. Um, I've never had that problem. For as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to work out. I wake up ready to go and jump into the day. That's never been a problem. But having said that, I don't want you to think, Wow, what a passionate guy. Wow, he's so cool. No, were you thinking that? <laughs> no. Um, I do believe that I'm wired that way. I think I have a compulsion to keep working on things. But I really don't take credit for that because I don't fight with it. It's just a natural proclivity to do that work. So, and by the way, I'm not a doctor. So if I use the word addiction or compulsion, um, I mean this in the casual sense. So no offense to any medical professionals who might make a comment saying that I'm using these terms incorrectly. My point is, I've always been interested in self-improvement and I've also found that there is a dark side to those efforts. So whatever level of self-improvement you're interested in, that's what I wanna talk about. Uh, whether you're on a lower level of self-improvement, you're happy just showing up to your job, maybe buying yourself a new pair of shoes once in a while to help your posture or taking a week off once in a while to improve your mental health. If that's your level of self-improvement, okay. Usually to the lower level of self-improvement, if we're on a scale of one to 10, if you're between like one and six, I'm here to always say, hey, do more, work harder. You can get more out of life. That's usually the type of speech I would give. But today I'm also speaking to the people on the top end, the people who wake up with a long list of goals, with super high standards, who are always hustling and working and pushing themselves. I'm giving those people a little bit of a warning. So if that's you, uh, listen up. Specific to martial arts, for instance, if you are on the high end of the self-improvement scale, you run the risk right off the bat, let's say, of overtraining. And right away you'll know what I'm talking about if that's you, right? Your knee hurts, but you wanna work out a little bit anyway, push it. You just had a surgery, because you were already overtraining or being a little reckless, and you'd like to hurry up that rehab and get back to it. There is a time, my friend, to put down the weights, to take a break, to try a different, softer style of exercise to allow your body to recover. That's part of the process. But it's just very hard if you define self-improvement as go, 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 work, 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 sweat, sweat, sweat. So right off the bat, watch out for overtraining. If you're a competitive-minded person, that might also lead you into steroids, right? Your self-improvement 
then leads you to taking unnatural boosts to your energy or to your recovery time or to your strength levels. And now you're playing around with hormones in your body and that can lead you into trouble. So just really quickly in one specific area, martial arts, you might find yourself overtraining, you might find yourself getting into drug use, and that's the point. Self-improvement is a drug unto itself. So I would like to frame this whole conversation in the idea that self-improvement is a drug. And like any drug, it can heal you, it can help you, or it can harm you and hurt you. Like any drug, you can use it to make your life better, or you can abuse it and make your life worse, whether you know it or not. Does that all make sense? Okay, well, if you're with me, let me specifically call out two uh, disadvantages to being a real hustler when it comes to self-improvement. And then, don't worry, I've got four tips <laughs> to help you hopefully get through that fog and find some peace. But let's start with the dark side of self-improvement. For me, the first big problem with aggressive self-improvement is that fear of missing out. Um, like I said, in my youth, I always felt that I was missing out. And I wish it had stopped there, but it didn't. To this day, as an adult, I struggle with that fear that I am missing a piece of the puzzle. Okay, perhaps you understand what I'm talking about. When I got into martial arts, and I'll use that as my main example, um, I was happy to find a style and a teacher. And at first you think, aha, these are the answers I've been looking for. This is the routine I've been looking for. Now I'm on track to improve my life, improve myself. But then you see another style you see another teacher, you meet another martial artist, and they have a different approach. They have a different set of priorities and a different set of routines. And you dabble a little bit and you experiment a little bit and you see value in what they're doing because there's value in everything. That's the problem. So now you've opened up this door to endlessly searching for something else. I don't wanna just say something better because it's all about self-improvement, but there's always this fear that you're not getting everything you could, so now you're always on the hunt for something else to add to what you're doing. I presume that sounds familiar to you. There's always another book to read. There's always another style to research. There's always another teacher to talk to or to learn from. There's always another exercise to try. The list is endless of things that you're not involved with. And that can be crippling at some point. It's overwhelming. There's just so much to try to keep up with and to experiment with. Even, let me, let me add this, even if you happen to be able to, if you can control that urge to keep looking over everyone else's fence to see what they're doing, even if you stay within your own style, you will find different teachers with different approaches to that same style. Right? And who's right? <laughs> who's wrong? It's very difficult when you're in student mode and you're just respecting everybody. You say, well, this guy's really great and he says, do it this way. But this other guy is also great and he says, do it that way. And that could be within the same style, let alone different styles. Personally, I've been very blessed to have met and worked with and been guided by, I feel, really great teachers. I think I've been very blessed. But it's also a curse. <laughs> because on the one hand, I get great information and great advice and great feedback and guidance. But these teachers don't agree with one another. And now I'm talking about outside of even the same style. I've looked at many styles because I have a problem. I've worked with many teachers because I'm obsessed, and they have different approaches. It's very difficult, in my mind, to deal with all that information. It's overwhelming. There is too much good stuff. There are too many choices. And that can be crippling to your progress. That can freeze you up. 
I have one teacher over here in a style that does not believe in kata or forms whatsoever, actually feels they're damaging to your progress. I have another teacher over here who's great, who pretty much only believes in kata and feels that's the best way to train and develop. And they're both great. They're both killers. They both represent a set of skills that I want, but they do not agree at all. So where are you left if you're a student of self-improvement? Who do you follow? Which advice do you listen to? That is a problem. And this is part of the dark side. You are always hunting for missing pieces to your puzzle, hoping that when you find that one little piece of information or that one more teacher, they can link everything. You'll have the, the big golden key to the whole project. It hasn't come across my path as of yet in my many years of searching, FYI. All right, so that is the first, I think, facet on the dark side of self-improvement. Uh, just that fear of missing out, the constant hunt. The second one, and this one's, boy, this will hit you right in the heart if you know what I'm talking about. It hurts my heart. The second one is that you never feel good enough. You work hard, you make progress, and there's a buzz. You get that endorphin kick. Ooh, I got better at something. But that fades so fast and immediately you're back to being overwhelmed by all of the things that you're not good at. Yes, you had your little victory here and it may be a hard fought, beautiful victory and it's a real victory, but who cares, man? That's just one little drop in this ocean of ineptitude, of incompetence. You're, you constantly just keep thinking about what you can't do, what you're not good at, where you're failing, where you have not put enough effort, uh, instead of focusing on this little gain that you made. That's a big problem. Um, as a matter of fact, I bet sometimes if you're a hard worker, even when you're making gains, you feel like you're not improving at all. You feel like you're getting worse. The harder I work, the more research I do, the more private lessons and seminars and videos and practice time, I just feel like it's getting worse. I can never keep up with my goals. It's a horrible, horrible situation. Oddly, as a teacher, I can tell you this. <laughs> when I ask students, particularly little kids, but then it grows into old age, but kids are much more honest and I can speak more clearly to them and they speak clearly to me. I will ask a student, hey, do you think you're good at this? How would you rate your skill right now on this particular, like a sidekick? Do you say you're good at a sidekick or not? And time and time again, here's what happens. The students who are not very good, the ones who are actually lazy, who don't practice, and maybe even don't even have an athletic gift, they are the ones who actually say that they're pretty good. They've got high levels of confidence. They feel they should get their new belt and be applauded. And on the flip side, the students who work hard, who listen, who grind it out and have some skill, whether that's uh, genetic or not, who actually can do the kick, time and time again, they'll tell me they're not very good. They don't wanna brag. They don't wanna say anything. They have a low opinion of their skills. It's bizarre. The people who should get the credit don't accept it. And the people who don't deserve any credit want all of it and expect it. It's a strange phenomenon. And I want to be honest with myself about where I fit into that. Am I someone who's not that good who thinks they're, I'm great? Or am I someone with skills who feels like an imposter a lot of the time and feels like I shouldn't even be teaching because I don't know what I'm doing? Where are you on that, on that scale? I'll leave that to you to figure out. Now, the reason this is a problem <laughs> is because on the one hand, this addiction to self-improvement is great because it gets you up and it gets you to class and it makes you work out. So it does keep you improving. 
But the bad part is, if you don't acknowledge your progress, if you keep feeling overwhelmed and frustrated and that you're missing out, you never gain confidence. And if you don't have confidence, one, you won't share what you know, and two, you won't really use it. So, okay, let's, again, specific to martial arts, if a bad situation's going down and you're the one there who might be able to take action to make it better or to stop it, if you're constantly doubting yourself and you feel like you're not that good, you won't step up. You'll feel like, I can't do this. I don't have the skills that are necessary. And you probably do. So you've lost that situation. You maybe save yourself, save someone else, whatever that was. But most of us probably won't be in uh, life and death situations that often. So the bigger sin or the bigger sadness here will be that you don't even share what you have. I get emails occasionally from people who say, gosh, I've been training for X number of years. Uh, I love what I'm doing. I love martial arts. My teacher asked me to take over a part of the class and I don't feel like I should do it. I don't feel I can do it. Or, gee, I'd love to start a club near me, but I don't feel like I'm ready yet. When do you think I'll be ready for that? Or, gee, my association won't give me permission to teach yet, and that's fine because I'm not ready yet, maybe someday. Yikes. Like I said, I believe even a little martial arts makes life a whole lot better. If you have skills and you can share them with other good people who are looking for those skills, then why in the world would you hesitate from sharing what you've got? You don't have to present yourself as the grand master, superstar, I know everything, as long as you're honest about your level, saying, here's what I've trained, here's what I feel I can offer you, and let me share this with you. If you want to have more, then I recommend this person or that style. Just be honest about what you're offering, and I don't think there should be any problem with that. Teach what you know. But again, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you feel like you've missed out, if you feel like you're no good, you will never share with anybody and that hurts the world and you'll never use your skills which might hurt you. I think that all makes sense. So, those are the two big problems with self-improvement. These are the dark sides. You're always frustrated because you're missing out or you feel that way and you actually never build up the confidence that should go along with the improvements that you've been making. No good. So let's get to the good stuff. Let's get to the tips. How do we break out of this? How do we get to the light side, the bright side of self-improvement? All right, tip number one. I would tell you to choose your goals wisely. If you share in my addiction to self-improvement, on whatever level that may be, from one to 10, you've got to be able to focus your efforts, I believe, into a narrower and narrower goal. When I was younger, because I was addicted to self-improvement, I was interested in music. So I was writing songs and joining bands and I love music. I thought that would be a career. I liked art. I loved drawing and painting. I thought that was a career. I loved writing and skits and acting. I thought that would be a career. I should get into movies. Um, even when Atari came out, I was addicted to getting the high score on my video game little console uh, compared to the games today. That's why to this day I don't have any video games in my place because I know if I have them, I'll get addicted to it and then I'll never sleep. So I've had to be very, very careful. Video games, I literally had to, one day when I had calluses and carpal tunnel as a little kid and my eyes were beet red, boxed it up and put it away because I at some point recognized it was unhealthy. But then it took me another 10 years, 20 years to put music aside, to put painting aside, to put writing uh, for screenplays, for movies and acting aside. That wasn't until my mid-30s when finally all of those things got pushed away so that I could focus on martial arts. I had always done martial arts, but it was one of many different interests that I was trying to improve. And at some point, I knew I needed to focus on the goal that was paying me back the most. Yes, I was interested in painting, but I'd never made a dime from it, and no one ever came to me and said, you're a great painter. <laughs> yes, I loved music. I wrote lots of songs, and I loved being in bands. But no one ever paid me to sing, and no one ever <laughs> paid for one of my songs. 
So at some point I said, gee, it's a lot of effort for not a lot of payback. Um, same with movies. I spent a lot of years writing screenplays and even shooting a couple of things on my own dime. <laughs> no payback for any of that. But martial arts was the one thing that no matter what I did, not necessarily paid back with money, but my progress, I knew in my personality and my character, my relationships, my just sense of confidence and peace of mind, martial arts always paid me back. I always felt that I got paid back more than the effort I put in. So for me, choosing a goal wisely meant focus. Focus on martial arts. And that's what I've been doing ever since. My mid-30s, I found a job in the martial arts and I started my website eight years ago. I'm just all in now on martial arts, come what may. I still might end up with nothing, but the payback on other, uh, other scales, not just money, but for my peace of mind, like I said, and my health and the way I feel in the world, it's priceless. So choose your goals wisely. Whichever one you choose, that's up to you. My second big tip, um, when you have this goal of yours, or if you're having trouble deciding on which goal to pick, focus on the why. Why is that your goal? What do you want out of it? I believe that the clearer you are about why you're doing something, why are you getting up out of bed? Why are you taking that class? Why are you working out? Why, why, why do you want to meet that person and interview here and listen to that video? Why? Once you know the why of you, that you're doing it, it's much, much easier to start cutting out the distractions. As far as martial arts, I can jump all over the place and say, oh my gosh, look at these parkour type martial art moves. Look at these acrobatic things over here. Ooh, look at stunt work for movies in martial arts. Ooh, look at all these cool weapons. Ooh, look at tournament style kata. Ooh, look at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu competitions. There are all kinds of things you can do under this umbrella of martial arts. If I know my why though, why do I love martial arts and what do I want out of martial arts? It's so much easier to start cutting off, I don't care about doing backflips. <laughs> I'm not interested in trophies. I can start cutting those things off, which means in my addiction to constantly looking for new pieces to the puzzle, there are places I don't have to look anymore. That's been very, very helpful. When I get a little lost and I get a little overwhelmed in my self-improvement goals, I come back to, what are you doing? What do you want? Why are you doing this? And that helps me say, oh yeah, right, right. You don't need to watch that video. You don't need to go to that seminar because that's not your future. That's not what you're interested in. So that'll be my second one. One, choose your goals wisely. Two, know why you chose that goal and make sure you're focused on that. That will help turn off a lot of the noise out there. Um, all right, number three, my third tip. Measure your progress with maturity. So by that I mean sometimes your progress is not obvious to you. And I've spoken about this before in previous podcasts. Sometimes your progress is completely invisible. You're working out. And when you're in that grind, when, you're, when your head's down, you really forget what you're gaining. You can't see it because you're in the trench. So remember that Kung Fu means work and time. It takes time to achieve these things, but it also takes time to recognize your achievements. So be patient with yourself. This is maturity to me. If you're immature and you say, oh, I want to be great at martial arts, how long does it take? Take two weeks? Can I just take this one course? Is that it? That's immature, right? That's like a little kid who wants everything right now. But as you get older and more mature, you realize that greatness takes time. Your best level of achievement will take time. And it also means that sometimes those steps towards your goal aren't obvious. They're invisible to you. The remedy for that is to remember how far you've come. Like I said, if your nose is down and you're in the trenches all the time, then you can't see the big picture. But if you sit up a little bit and take a break, step out of the trench, and compare where you are now 
to where you were a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, then I think immediately you'll say, oh yeah, look at me. I'm pretty proud of what I've accomplished. Five years ago, I wasn't even close to what I'm doing now. I'm so far ahead. So of course, it should be clear to not compare yourself to other people. They've got their own problems, whether you know about them or not. But compare yourself to yourself in the past. Focus on your future, know where you're going and why, and measure that progress towards that goal with maturity. Be patient and gentle with yourself. Look to your past to remind yourself how far you're coming and to give you the faith to keep grinding for the future. The only way you get faith for the future is if you have uh, recognized what you've accomplished in your past. So keep a little eye on both, okay? My last tip here, fourth, fourth tip, is to commit. Commit to something. Now, if you're in your teens or your 20s, this advice will be a little premature probably for you. But please know that self-improvement is self-improvement. No one can do it for you. No one's going to tell you what you want out of your work. No one's going to tell you what fulfills you. No one's going to give you the why for what you're doing. It's a selfish pursuit, but selfish in the kindly way of the better you can make yourself, the better able you'll be to help other people. The more you'll have to offer when you're feeling comfortable now to share with others and help others. Commit to something means you fight that overwhelm of hunting for all of these puzzle pieces. What does this teacher say? What does that style do? You're overwhelmed. If you commit, that problem goes away. It doesn't mean that you don't respect all of the different teachers that you've worked with, all of the different approaches, all of the different styles. It just means that you recognize maturely that if you want to be great at what you do, at what makes you tick, you've got to dig down into that. You've got to commit to it at some point. If you think about it, Think about all the great masters you've worked with, the great teachers that you look up to, all of your mentors. None of them are great at everything, right? Each of them is great at what they do. If you ask them to do something different, they will fail just as much as you will. Nobody's great at everything. Nobody is great at everything. So why are you trying to be great at everything? You can't. So if you commit to something, you're merely saying to yourself, okay, I've seen a lot of different things. It's time for me to choose one. Rather than go out into a field, if you're a farmer or a gardener, and just throwing seeds everywhere, far and wide, you're just tossing seeds randomly all over the place, that's not going to get you anywhere. At some point, you've got to shrink the size of that garden and give it your attention. You can't till all of the soil in the world. You don't have enough water for all of that land. You can't go out and weed and fertilize all of that land. If you want a beautiful garden that produces real produce, then you've got to focus it and put your efforts into one little space and let that bloom and let that grow. Tend to a smaller garden. It's, it's taken me a long time to understand that because it seems like it's always better to, oh, I'm open-minded. Oh, I'm, I'll learn from everybody. Yes, there's a very positive side to that. But if you want to be great like your teachers are, if you want to be a mentor to someone else, if you want to be the expert at something, you've got to start picking and choosing something. I cut away video games and music and painting and writing and acting and all kinds of stuff so I could become a martial artist. And not just any kind of martial artist, a specific kind of martial artist, meeting my goals, focusing on things that fulfill my why. I can't tell you what those are for you, but please know, if you haven't already, at some point, you're gonna need to buckle down and commit to a training style, 
a training routine, something. Please do that. It's also important, I should just mention before we wrap this up, that again, your goal, whatever it is that you've chosen, at some point may not be to necessarily improve. It may just be to keep what you have. When you're younger and you're on the hunt, it's gain, 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 gain. That's your focus, get more. As you get older and you have fewer resources of energy, recovery time, uh, enthusiasm perhaps, I don't know, your goal may become to simply maintain. That's fine. Just be honest about what you're doing. Don't feel bad about it. If your why has changed, if your goal has modified, great. Just be clear about it so again, you can shut out the distractions and stay on the light side of self-improvement. That's pretty much what I wanted to cover today. The idea simply is we are all students of self-improvement on some level. If you're on the low end, I encourage you to kick it up a notch or two because I think it's worth it. If you're on the high end, I caution you to see self-improvement as a drug. I encourage you to use that drug, but not abuse that drug. I encourage you to look at what you've been doing, your efforts, look at your progress honestly and with a mature eye, and make sure that you're doing more help to your life than harm. Make sure you're finding more healing properties out of your work instead of hurtful and harmful uh, results. There is a beautiful bright side to hard work. That should, there should be no doubt about that. I wouldn't be here at all. When I say fight for a happy life, I'm a happy guy simply because I believe in self-improvement. Always have, always will. That's wired into me. However much of that's wired into you, Throw gas on that fire and use it. Beware of the dark side. Walk on the bright side. And I really do believe that is the way you're going to have the happiest life possible, the most fulfilling life possible. Self-improvement. Use it. Don't abuse it. Boy, I'm glad I got all that off my chest. Thank you so much for sharing some time with me today. And as always, I'm curious what you have to say about the bright side and the dark side of self-improvement. Please feel free to leave me a comment or a question and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, smiles up, my friend. Let that smile be your shield and your sword. Keep fighting for a happy life.